Thanks, Kristen. I'm too relaxed to give a talk. But that's the way it's supposed to be, right? Exactly. You know, there was a, once a minister who was preoccupied with thoughts of how he was going to ask the congregation to come up with more money than they were expecting for repairs of the building. It's not us. Therefore, he was annoyed to find out that the regular organist was sick and a substitute had been brought in at the very last minute. The substitute wanted to know what to play. Well, here's a copy of the service, the minister said impatiently, but you'll have to think of something to play after I make the announcement about the finances. So during the service, the minister paused and said, Brothers and sisters, we are in great difficulty. The roof repairs cost twice as much as we expected, and we need $4,000 more. So any of you who can pledge $100 or more, please stand up. And at that moment, the substitute organist played the Star Spangled Banner. And that's how he got the job permanently. I'd like to share some thoughts today about unity. I wanted to share some thoughts about what I love about our practice and what we do here. One of my absolute favorite things about unity is its commitment to the practical approaches to spiritual realization, not theory, practical. So that brings me to say I'm still in love with the original name of our organization, the Unity School of Practical Christianity. The Unity School of Practical Christianity. There are many, many wonderful ideas packed into those five words. First of all, of course, unity. How many of you have read James Dillett Freeman's book on the history of unity called The House of Truth? Okay. You might remember in there, this is what he talks, this is his account of how the name unity was chosen. I'm going to read this. In the spring of 1891, Charles Fillmore and his wife and a few students met together one evening to pray. As they were sitting in the silence, suddenly, into Fillmore's mind, flashed the word unity. At, that, at the moment, he had not even been thinking about a name, and when it came to him, it startled him. But he cried out, that's it, unity, he told the others. Unity, that's the name for our work, the name we've been looking for. Later, he told friends the name came right out of the ether, just as the voice of Jesus was heard by Paul in the heavens. No one else heard it, but it was as clear to me as though someone had spoken to me. Then and there, the name Unity was adopted. It was an apt and fortunate choice. The Fillmores had borrowed the best from all religions. Where the churches had put the emphasis on controversial doctrinal points that had caused division after division in the Christian world, Charles and Myrtle Fillmore were to put their emphasis on the things that are practical, the things that apply to everyday thinking and living. They were not to found a new religion, but to work within the framework of existing religions and appeal to church members without causing them to divorce themselves from their church. They were to propound a teaching that people of all faiths could study and apply to their lives. They were to be a force for unity in the world. The movement that Charles and Myrtle Fillmore had founded was to live and grow under this name, Unity. James Dillett Freeman's account. Now since Unity has been our name for 129 years, it's been 129 years ago this spring that Fillmore had that vision, it's difficult for us to appreciate what a breakthrough that inspiration must have been for that little group of people gathered in the Fillmore's living room in those earliest days. Remember, their work had only begun formally two years earlier, when in 1889, the Fillmores published the magazine that they originally called Modern Thought. The next year, in 1890, they changed the name to Christian Science Thought, but as you might imagine, so many people assumed that that meant we were affiliated with Mary Baker Eddy's church, that soon the Fillmore's realized they had to change the name, so they tried the word 
the title Thought, just Thought, for a couple more months. Now, it's certainly a shame that they decided not to keep a reference to science in the name of our work, for the word science has a great resonance in the search for truth. The word science is found in all the various new thought approaches, for we have all come to believe that the lifting up of consciousness is done through the application of an exact spiritual science. There is, in the title of Ernest Holmes' great book, A Science of Mind, and we can all study and profit from it. But nonetheless, unity has a power of its own, for it points the way to the fundamental law of this great science of mind, namely, that there is only one presence, one power, one love, active in our lives and in our world. All things that appear separate to our human senses are in fact united in God. Unity is not a place or an idea, but rather it's an experience in this moment, an experience in this moment and the next moment of omnipresence. I am one with all existence, visible and invisible. I am one with all existence, visible and invisible. So I love unity as the name for our work. I also love that we were founded as a school, not as a church. A school is a center for learning, while a church is a center for worship. Perhaps ultimately these are not all that different from one another, but especially for the beginning, beginner, the distinction is useful. Most of us found our way to unity because something in our lives wasn't working we were experiencing a dissatisfaction. Things weren't going the way we wanted them to. Perhaps we were dealing with a serious illness, a life-threatening illness, or a sudden loss of income or financial security. Maybe we found ourselves estranged from a loved one, or, or maybe we were suffering from a broken heart after a breakup. Well, whatever the challenge, what we all had in common was our sense that what we used to rely on to get us through tough times was no longer delivering. We were open to learning a new way. And so we found ourselves here back in school. For unity teaches, and it teaches practical ways to rebuild our lives, to find love, to restore health, to restore prosperity. We came because we were hurting and unity offered healing. And notice that Unity's founding text reinforces this sense that we are in a school. Emily Cady's book is called Lessons in Truth. Lessons in Truth that promises to teach us the truth about God and our relationship in unity with him. Charles Fillmore reinforced this commitment to learning the science of God in the very first edition of their magazine, Modern Thought. He wrote this. We want the address of every lecturer and healer working on the spiritual plane. Our aim is to spread all over this great West the good which we know lies in wait for those who are willing to receive it. We are not wedded to any school of metaphysics, hence shall be strictly impartial in our efforts. And then not much later, he elaborated on this. He said, unity is not a sect not a separation of people into an exclusive group of know-it-alls. Nobody in this room is a know-it-all, right? Unity is the truth that is taught in all religions, simplified and systematized, so that anyone can understand and apply it. Students of unity do not find it necessary to sever their church affiliations. The church needs the vitalization that this renaissance of primitive Christianity gives it primitive in the sense of the first. And now, 130 or so years later, Capital City Unity continues this powerful mission. We, too, are a school for exploring this great science of divine mind and spiritual realization by studying together our lessons in truth. So I love the name Unity 
I love that we are a school where I can continue to learn about the God within and how in, I am in fact that. I am the God that is within me and not a mere individual called Marty. Thirdly, I love that the lessons we study in our school are practical in nature. Now there are two aspects of this essential word practical that I think work together to explain why our founders chose to emphasize this aspect of their spiritual experience and how to share it. The first sense of the word is that the Fillmores believed that experiencing God and all the powers that our connection with God brings us could be achieved in a simple, straightforward, and easily understood way. They found that their own work with spirit was something sensible, down to earth, almost businesslike. We all know Myrtle Fillmore discovered that in order to restore health to her body in light of her tuberculosis diagnosis, she could simply speak affirmative words of health to all the cells in her body with conviction and commitment. And that's all there was to it. She didn't need to understand the theory of spiritual healing. She didn't need to study the laws of applying truth principles. She didn't need to read Mary Baker Eddy's Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures to do the work of healing. No, what she had to do was straightforward, practical, and simple to do. And so it is today, over a century later. Our unity message is still simple, effective, and universally available to anyone who wants to hear it. And that brings us to the second sense of the word practical. It involves practice. We are working on reprogramming our thinking, and that takes time and discipline. As we learn to apply our denials and affirmations, we find that creating and using them is simple and easy, but manifesting what they promise us requires a committed practice. Similarly, meditation is simplicity itself. As Kristen led us, the very simple process of just observing. But a single 30-minute meditation session is not going to shift all by itself much in our hearts and souls. Meditation takes practice for it to yield its riches. The, the dictionary defines practice as repeated exercise in or performance of an activity or skill so as to acquire or maintain proficiency in it. Again, that was how Myrtle co-created with God the breakthrough in the healing of her tuberculosis. For almost two years, she repeated the activity of denials and affirmations with a determined focus on her body's health. She let nothing deter her. Even when the necessities of her duties as a mother or a wife took attention away from her discipline, she just got back to her routine as soon as possible with no self-recrimination. So our co-founders understood the simple but effective truth that practice makes perfect. Practice makes perfect. Now, many simple practices have been developed for true students over the years since the beginning, like Emmett Fox's practices in the Golden Key. Every one of you who hasn't got one is going to get a copy of it today. Stratton Smith's 4T. How many have done Stratton's 4T practice? Simple. And Charles Fillmore's Keep a True Lent, which we're working on right now. These are all simple practices, but they require our attention and commitment and our willingness to repeat the lessons, the affirmations, and denials. And they are all simple, direct, and effective. So finally, I love that unity is an expression of Christianity. We are the unity school of practical Christianity. Not because our Christian faith is superior to any other system of faith, but because it's the faith I was raised in. And it's the faith of our American culture. This means that I, like most of us, grew up in a Christian milieu, embedded in the stories and assumptions of the Jesus history, 
and the system of belief that was developed after his death and resurrection. I was born into a Catholic family. Both of my parents also grew up in Catholic families. As a kid, I would go to Catholic school. Going to church every Sunday was as much a part of my childhood as running around outside or playing with my dog. Sunday Mass, with its use of Latin and color and ritual, candles, music, formed a fundamental sense for me of religion. And I attended Catholic school every year from second grade. For some reason, our local Catholic school didn't have a first grade. Uh, until my third year of university. That's 13 years of an education steeped in Catholic Christian assumptions and perspectives. For example, I can still remember the excitement of my parents and grandparents when John Kennedy was running for president. They were excited that a Catholic might be elected president of the United States. And, of course, he was the first and so far the only Catholic to be elected. But that was a big deal. So you might imagine, given all those years of training in a, a particular and very powerful religious faith, you might imagine my shock when I went to Georgetown University, a Jesuit university, in my freshman year, and I took my the required theology class, and it was called The Problem of God because I had no idea there was a problem with God. But after all, those were the 60s. And so you will also not be surprised that after two years of Jesuit university, I finally left Catholic education as a thoroughly convinced atheist. In fact, I didn't come back to anything remotely Christian until the day I stepped foot in Christ Unity Church in 1998 some 27 years after leaving my Jesuit college for the University of Michigan. And yet, on that day, as I sat in the back of the church on Folsom Boulevard, and I heard Dorothy Pearson say, as we did earlier this morning, there is only one presence and one power active in my life, God the good, omnipotent, I found myself shivering with an unexpected and powerful emotion that was certainly drawing on all those years of Christian training. Now one thing that unity offered me that Catholicism did not, not even the Jesuits, was the metaphysical interpretation of the Bible. And what a gift this has been, what a blessing, to return to the scriptures that I had abandoned years before and to discover in them practical information rich in the power to help generate and guide spiritual transformation. This has been for me a pearl of great price. Finding in the words of my Christian and Catholic faith teachings of practical value that could bring about healing, peace, and love to my life's experience is still, to this day, a precious discovery that words cannot adequately describe. And once I understood the metaphysical keys to the Bible, I learned I could apply the same methodology to scriptures of other faiths. In this way, I found parallel riches in the Hindu texts, in the Upanishads, in Buddhism, in the, in the Tao Te Ching of Lao Tzu, in the poetry of the Sufi mystics of Islam, and in the faith system found in the Jewish Kabbalah. Metaphysical interpretation that I learned here at Unity. But it turns out that was valuable not only in the world of scripture, as Phil Pearson has often taught us, even in the world of physical sciences, and particularly in the implications of quantum physics and the theory of relativity, I could find new resonance based on metaphysical interpretation that I learned in our New Thought teachings. Even in the recovery work I do in my adult children of alcoholics 12-step meetings is greatly enriched by what I've learned here. This unity school of practical Christianity has been the richest, most rewarding classroom of my life. And it's all thanks to two things. First, to the very practical tools that I've learned here. Denials affirmations, 
meditation, surrender, letting go and letting God. And secondly, to you, my brothers and sisters, my fellow students and practitioners who have been so generous in sharing your experience, strength, and hope with me. Just as the Fillmores did as they shared their breakthroughs with that first circle of folks in Kansas City all those years ago, we offer to one another the recognition of the truth of our belief that we are all individualized expressions of the one and only activity reality, activity of reality that we call God. You can see in me, even when I can't see it in myself, the God of me. And I can see in you, even when you can't see it in yourself, the God of you. This is the power of our practice. Simple, straightforward, effective. I love the covenant that the Fillmores wrote and signed as they came to the realization that this unity thing that they had stumbled into was actually going to be their life's work. Many of you have read it, but maybe some of you haven't. This is what they wrote. We, Charles Fillmore and Myrtle Fillmore, husband and wife, hereby dedicate ourselves, our time, our money, all we have and all we expect to have to the spirit of truth and through it to the society of silent unity. It being understood and agreed that the said spirit of truth shall render unto us in equivalent for this dedication, in peace of mind, health of body, wisdom, understanding, love, life, and an abundant supply of all things necessary to meet every want without making any of these the object of our existence. In the presence of the conscious mind of Jesus Christ, the seventh day of December, A.D. 1892. Now this is what we their spiritual descendants also understand in equal measure with Charles and Myrtle Fillmore that our spiritual work here and now in the same dedication to truth principles as they had when they wrote their covenant, this dedication, this practice, simple, straightforward and effective, is now in this moment rendering to us all we require, quoting their covenant of peace of mind, health of body, wisdom, understanding, love, life, and abundant supply of all things necessary to meet our every want without making any of these the object of our existence. Unity, school of practical Christianity. This is the blessing that we have come together on a weekly basis to celebrate, to study, to practice, to share. This is the great blessing that we have all been led to. And for this, I am very grateful. And I'd like to seal this in our hearts by singing again the song we started out with, What a Fellowship, number 203. We'll sing through the first stanza, and shall we rise, number 203. And so, Divine Presence, we thank you that in our Christ presence in the Unity School of Practical Christianity, we can lean and be safe and secure on your everlasting arms. Thank you, God. Amen.